should. <laughs> okay, you're good. All right, uh, welcome back. This is week three of Basic Christianity. And you can see on your handout, your four-page handout, uh, it says weeks three and four, the resurrection of Christ. So today and next week, I want to talk about the resurrection. And I have books I'd like to recommend. First of all, this series is based on John Stott's Basic Christianity. And if you want to pass these around or look at them, you can get ISBN numbers, whatever. Today and next week, I'm going to refer to, and I often in my classes refer to, Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. And a uh, very wonderful book. And also, Lee Strobel's The Case for the Real Jesus. So if you want to pass those around and look at them or whatever, they're here. All right. Um, hmm. Any questions from last time or anything we've been talking about? Ready to go jump into it? All right, let's do it. We're looking at the core beliefs of biblical Christianity. And last time we looked at the outlandish claims of Jesus Christ. He talked about himself in such a way that we cannot accept him as merely a wise teacher. As C.S. Lewis said, he's either, based on uh, just what he claimed, Jesus Christ was either Lord, liar, or lunatic. And so we, he clearly claimed to be God, and so we take him as being God. And today, I want to, and next week, I want to look at the resurrection, which is the foundation of the Christian faith. And specifically, what I want to look at is um, arguments against the resurrection. There's a lot of people who say that the resurrection never happened, including people that claim to be Christians. Uh, and so I just want to, uh, that's kind of going to be the focus today, more an apologetic look of that the resurrection actually did happen. And please stop me if you have any questions. Where's Eric, by the way? That's my question. Oh, no, he went to check on the sound. Okay. And then he should be here. Okay. So. He said he went to check, and I was like filling in the blanks. He went to check the Slovakia. <laughs> <laughs> but then I was like, that part doesn't even exist anymore. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it does. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Check your clock. Okay. So we're going to look at the resurrection, which is the foundation of the Christian faith. And I want you to think about what Paul wrote. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 17. He said, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ... We are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. So Paul is saying that without the resurrection, Christianity is meaningless. It is the core of the faith. Um, so it is the person and work of Jesus Christ that are unique, not merely his teachings that we put his faith in. And, well, okay. So let me talk about a uh, professor of religious studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, named Bart Ehrman. He's actually a pretty famous uh, professor of religious study. You know, when I went to college, I, I was naive, and I thought that if you go to college and you can take religion classes, and I thought that's where you can learn all about the Bible and Christianity and all that stuff. And boy, was I mistaken. Anyway, uh, the, the worst place to go to learn about the Bible and to learn about faith in God is a religion department at a major university. So anyway, that was my awakening uh, when I went to college. But anyway, this fellow, Bart Ehrman, he is a professor of religious studies at UNC Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. And he wrote a best-selling book in 2006, which demonstrates, he shows that the text of the Bible is not trustworthy, that it has been corrupted over the centuries. Now, and there are scores of scholars like him who say that the resurrection never happened. Now, by the way, uh, the topic of the the uh, manuscripts that we have, the, the Bible, and how well it's been maintained over the centuries, and where the corruptions are. That's a fascinating study to me, and my study of it has shown that actually we have with great reliability what the original said. And that's a topic I've taught on in ABF at least every two or three years. I try to go back to that. So we won't go back to it today, unless you all want to talk specifically about it. Uh, I won't do that in this series. But um, this fellow, Dr. Ehrman, he wrote a book that is basically sensationalistic, meaning uh, just anywhere he could like take pot shots at the reliability, or let's say it this way, to talk about the corruption of the text. 
uh, he shows, look, this is, uh, his attitude is like, this is what the church has been hiding from you. Look how corrupted it is. And the thing is, everything he writes about is factually true. He writes about the, where there's uh, the different manuscripts, there's this text and this text, but what he does is he sensationalizes it. He blows it out of, he blows it out of proportion and he doesn't talk about that actually the, uh, what we do have w when we put together all the puzzle pieces, we do have great reliability of the text. But he doesn't talk about that great reliability. He just talks about, look, this part and this little part of the jigsaw puzzle. But anyway, that's a topic for another day. Uh, there was a 2007 TV documentary claiming that archaeologists had found the bones of Jesus. Well, that just sounds weird. That just sounds weird, right? Because Jesus, the tomb was empty. Okay, so, but this TV documentary, and if it's on TV, it must be true, right? Um, then there's, uh, they were big in the 1990s. You don't hear them by this name anymore, but the Jesus Seminar, uh, a very liberal group. Again, they were, they were big in the 90s, and there have been offshoots of them, but they're a self-proclaimed group of scholars that enjoy popularity in their message that the Bible cannot be trusted. Um, well, so there are always groups that come out with uh, saying that the Bible can't be trusted. And particularly when we're talking about the resurrection, usually about March, right before Easter mm -hmm. and Christmas, is when you get the Time magazine, the Newsweek magazine, the article about how, you know, here is the real Jesus, or here's the real story behind Easter. And it, like clockwork, you know, every March, uh, those magazines come out with that. So today I want to introduce you to the various objections to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. And my goal is to show you the fallacy in those arguments. So um, any questions so far, comments? What have you heard on the street? Yeah. Okay. Did my family just desert? Like, yeah. Okay. Well, good, because they probably found a Sunday school teacher. Okay. But, okay, so one objection to the resurrection is that, the res is that resurrecting a dead body is physically impossible. Well, duh. I mean, that, that's an objection people raise, that a dead body can't be raised, that's, that's impossible, therefore it didn't happen. And, and that's really the point, if, uh, uh, you know, that this is supernatural, it's a miracle. This is the argument from that group, the Jesus Seminar. Uh, their argument goes like this, God could not have performed that miracle because miracles don't occur. And I say, that's just atheism right there. So they say, no, supernatural things don't occur. But if, if you're going to disbelieve supernatural things, just go ahead and be atheist. I mean, that's what atheism is. But so the point is that God raised him, and only God can raise the dead. So it, it's not a very solid argument there, but that's one that I hear. Remember the Apostle Paul wrote, and going back to that first verse that I read, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Okay, so you contrast what Paul wrote with this excerpt from Time magazine. This is April 95, uh, demonstrating what many professing Christians believe. So I'm quoting to you from a, uh, a story in an April Time magazine issue. It says, five churchgoers sit around a table in the rectory of St. George's Episcopal Church in Hawthorne, California. They all hold different views about whether the stories of Christ's miracles are true. They disagree about how much they matter. Quote, whether those actions actually occurred is somewhat irrelevant to me, observes Alan Rulston, a mechanical engineer. It's the spirit of the message that is more important. So a lot of people, um, and generally this is not in evangelical churches, but in many churches around the country, and I'll say particularly California, but just around, uh, say the, the resurrection, the actual raising of a, of a dead body, of, of our dead Lord, uh, didn't actually happen, but the resurrection, it, there's a deeper meaning to it. And that's just nonsense. Bart Ehrman, the religious studies professor, he said, because historians can only establish what probably happened, and a miracle of this nature is highly improbable, the historian cannot say it probably occurred. Now, if someone had said that Jesus was raised by natural causes, I'd say that would be highly improbable. But the declaration is that God raised him, and God can do anything. God has power over everything in the universe. So if God does exist, 
uh, and he wanted Jesus raised, then certainly that would be the most probable of explanations. If there is a dead body that is now alive, seen walking around and talking to people and eating and everything, uh, the most reasonable conclusion is that it must be that God did that, because only God can do that. So we're going to look at the evidence to see what really happened. Of course, we know what happened. It's in the Bible. But we're going to look at the evidence uh, the eyewitness evidence, corroborating evidence, evidence from outside sources. And I know I don't need to convince you all that the resurrection happened, but again, I look at this from an apologetic frame of mind, meaning uh, that I will run into people who, uh, friends, family, uh, at the school, uh, students of mine, I'll run into people who don't believe in the resurrection, who maybe believe in some of these theories that I've told you, and just being able to uh, talk to people about these things. So, any questions before I drive on? No? Okay. Are the children all right? Okay. Okay, so I want to talk about different theories about what really happened <laughs> instead of Jesus being raised from the dead. Theories doubting the resurrection of Jesus. And the first one I want to talk about is some people say the disciples weren't writing history. These are just fables. Now, generally, when someone says, oh, those fables in the Bible, uh, generally, my initial assumption when I hear that is that this person hasn't actually read the Bible, um, has just heard of oh, the Bible, a bunch of nonsense fables. Because when you read the Bible, um, whether you believe what's written in it or not, I find it hard that you would come out away and saying, oh, those are just fables, like Aesop's fables, because they are very detailed, the way fables are not. They are very, uh, very explicit in their detail. They are very explicit in not only showing the good, but also showing the bad. There's just, it's written like um, someone who is trying to get all the details right. Um, Back to that Time Magazine article, uh, continuing what the article said. It says, yet liberals argue that it is not blasphemy to say the resurrection never happened because accounts of Christ's rising are meant metaphorically. In this view, one robs the Bible of its richness and poetry by insisting it should be read literally. So we are robbing the Bible of its richness <laughs> by insisting on literalness. Jesus was resurrected in the lives and dreams of his followers. The body of Christ is the church, not a reconstituted physical body. The resurrection represents an explosion of power, a promise of salvation that does not depend on a literal belief in physical resurrection. So, I'm waiting for a collective phooey from you. <laughs> phooey, yeah. No, 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 John, I would say, as you were talking about that article, I yeah. think that is what I believed as a child. I think I because I wasn't raised in a Christian home, I yeah. thought it was a story. I thought, oh, right. it's, a, it's neat that they made, <laughs> made it seem like he raised, but I didn't think he actually physically did. Yeah. And so it just proves even more that you need to make sure your children are knowing <laughs> what the yes. word says. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'll iterate that when you actually read scripture, you read the gospel accounts, and you take it from the mindset of this is a fable, it's like, they went into a lot of detail to write this fake, like a lot of detail. And so you have to, you can't just take it as um, it's a fable, but you have to take it as someone, either this is a truthful account, or someone went to great lengths to write an elaborate lie, um, but just a, you know, like Aesop's fable. Yeah, it's, it's got to be something going on more than that. Yeah. Okay. Literary experts are familiar, hi, <laughs> so it, they say, oh, it's just written as a fable. Well, there are literary experts, people whose business, whose line of work is looking at different genres and also taking uh, when something is written down and determining based on different genres of writing, like fables or fiction or nonfiction, uh, what is this that I have in front of me? And they say that, um, the, they say that, uh, well, the people who say the Bible is fables insist that these were not meant to be taken literal, literally. But the gospel accounts are in the genre of biographies. And literary experts say, no, these are clearly biographies. These are history that are written, meant to be taken as such. 
And generally, that is the job of uh, uh, people who study ancient writings to look at and say, you know, I'm not just talking about the Bible, but any ancient writings. What was the intent of the author when, when they wrote this? And so, uh, you know, you take Caesar's accounts of the Gallic Wars, and historians say, yes, Caesar's intent was to write a history and to make himself look good, by the way, but Caesar's intent was to do that. And they read Homer's Iliad, and they say, okay, the clear intent was a fiction, and it's more detailed than that, but they look at ancient writings and say, what was the intent of the author? And we take it as face, at face value. And it's clear that the, uh, the writers, these gospels, were clearly writing what they believed to be what they saw, what they witnessed. Um, we also have multiple independent, so we have multiple independent sources. Uh, we have corroboration from outsiders. We have corroboration from what I call hostile witnesses, meaning even people who had no, um, no desire to support Christianity, to give Christian propaganda. Even enemies of the Christian faith wrote things that support, you know, letters to each other. Uh, emperors and governors writing about how they are punishing Christians wrote things in support of what the Bible says. Um, there are many other flaws to that theory of, of just a fable. Uh, there was clearly an empty tomb. There is uh, history about how uh, the tomb was empty. Of course, they, they say that the, the tomb was robbed of, uh, of the body, but there, that, is, that appears in history, not just in the Bible. Um, so we also look at Paul's and James's conversions and many people's conversions. Paul would not have converted because of a fable. Uh, it so it requires more than that. Okay, so that's the fable theory. Any questions on that? All right. So did Jesus really rise from the dead? Yes. The evidence shows that the New Testament is written as a history, not just a legend, not just a lie. And if you want to get more into that, I recommend, uh, again, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. He wrote a series of books. The, all the titles start with the case for something or other. And this is the first one that he wrote, and I highly recommend it. And so I refer a lot to that book in this series. Uh, skeptics have one possible attack. They say perhaps the writers were deceived, meaning the writers believed that they were writing the truth, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they were wrong. They were in error. Maybe they were fooled into thinking that Jesus had risen. Some liberals believe that the disciples thought they saw the risen Jesus, but they were tricked. So here are the explanations for the resurrection that are most frequently offered by skeptics. One is that the disciples were deceived, meaning they hallucinated, hallucinated seeing Jesus. Have any of y'all ever hallucinated before? Like a real legit hallucination? I have. Okay. Was that? What did you say you were not? I have, yes. Oh. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> Jesus was seen by many, many, many people. You're wondering about, okay. <laughs> Jesus, I'll tell you about my hallucination, but Jesus was seen by many, 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 many people. And a flaw to that theory is that hallucinations are always experienced by individuals. Groups do not hallucinate the same thing. Um, now for me, my, my one hallucination that I remember is uh, I was in the army, and I hear a lot of hallucination stories about people under high, high stress, and particularly in the military, particularly with very little sleep. And for me, it was during army training uh, in uh, Fort Bragg, and we had been uh, in the field for like three or four days, and very, very little sleep, maybe an hour to a day or something like that. Uh, but we were just on the march and going and going. And uh, after a while, so we were, again, this is just training, not real uh, uh, deployed or anything. But so we're, we're sneaking up on an enemy base, and it's dark. And so I'm really quiet, and I think I'm with somebody, and we're behind a tree or on the ground, and we're sneaking up, we're looking for the enemy, and we don't know where they were. And I see all uh, blue lights, blue flashlights. Now, the enemy, again, they're good guys, but are just training, but the enemy, they're not going to be shining blue lights all around because they're trying to stay quiet in the dark. We're trying to stay quiet in the dark. But I see the enemy flashing blue lights all around, and I say they're over there. 
And my, my buddy says, well, I don't see them. I said, well, they're flashing blue lights all around. It's like, there's no blue lights. I'm like, yeah, there's blue lights. So but we had our flashlights in the Army. Our flashlights had filters. There was red filters and blue filters. Uh, blue filters for signaling and red filters for reading in the dark. But I thought they were signaling. Anyway, so that was my one experience with the hallucination. I read about Navy SEALs during their, their training. There is one particular week. I mean, all Navy SEAL training is horrendous, but there's one particular week that's really, really bad, extreme stress. They average about an hour of sleep per day, and there are hallucinations reported by 75% of students. They're out, uh, I think, out in the San Diego area. They're out just in the surf, uh, just way, way out from shore doing all their training. They have hallucinated uh, paddling, the, so they're out there swimming, no raft, no boat or anything, just out there swimming, doing all their training. They've hallucinated that they're, uh, actually, I'm sorry, at one time they weren't hallucinating, they were in a raft on the ocean during this, and uh, hallucinations of an octopus coming up and waving <laughs> at him. Uh, another one hallucinated that a train was coming, so they're on a raft in the, in the ocean, and a train is coming right at them, headed straight for the raft. Um, Another one would hallucinate that a large, there was a large wall that the raft was going to crash into, just hallucinate a big uh, brick wall that they're going to crash into. Nobody else saw these things. That's my point here. Everyone at Navy SEAL training, or at least 75%, they hallucinate different things, but they don't all hallucinate. One says, oh, there's a brick wall, and the other doesn't say, yeah, I see it too. Yeah, we all see it. Individuals hallucinate different things. My buddy, who might have been hallucinating something else <laughs> later that week, he didn't also see the blue lights I saw. Um, another, another fellow, a soldier, he wrote, he said, during, uh, I'll just quote for you what he wrote, during the ground war in Desert Storm, my gunner refused to swap out and drive so I could catch 30 minutes of sleep here and there. As a result, I got barely two hours over the course of four plus days. So we're driving through this oil field, and some sporadic fighting is happening. I stopped driving. Why? To wait for the school bus. <laughs> oh, no. I saw a school bus ahead of us stop, let kids off, and then start to move again. My tank commander comes over the, the radio and asks me what was wrong. I told him I was waiting on the bus. <laughs> that was when he forced the gunner to drive for two hours so I could get sleep. <laughs> So anyway, hallucinations do happen under high stress and particularly under low sleep, but different people don't see the same hallucination. So when we read about Jesus appearing to this person, that person, and a whole groups of disciples and whole groups of many people, they didn't all hallucinate the same thing. Jesus didn't appear to just one person. He appeared on several separate occasions over a 40-day period. He was seen by men and women. He was walking. He was talking. He was eating. He was inside and outside. Excuse me. By more than 500 people, he was seen. They physically touched him, and he ate real food. Um, Thomas was highly skeptical. You can maybe imagine that you know that he appeared to all the disciples except Thomas after uh, he was raised from the dead, and. They were so thrilled. They all saw him. They were with him. But Thomas wasn't there. And they told Thomas, Jesus appeared to us. And Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it. So Thomas said, unless I see him, I'm not going to believe it. So Thomas was mentally, intellectually on his guard. He was like, maybe they got fooled, but I'm not going to believe it. And so then when Thomas was there, Jesus appeared. And Thomas, who was on his guard, saw Jesus. And so there's definitely something to that. And then you think about some other flaws. Well, you still have to, if you think about that they hallucinated seeing Jesus, there's still the matter of the empty tomb. If 500 plus people report seeing the risen Jesus, and remember this was a rumor that the, the Romans and the Jews wanted to quash. They would want to put that down. They would want to stomp this newfound religion into the ground. An easy way to do that, if people are reporting, we have seen Jesus whom they crucified, they could have gone to the tomb, brought out the body, I know that's sick, but they could have gone to the tomb, brought out the body and said, no, he's dead, he's here, we buried him. And that could have in ended Christianity right there. But nobody was able to do that. 
They could have, they should have, if they wanted to squash that rumor that Jesus was seen alive. Okay, any anything on that? Questions? Okay. All right. Hallucinating can be very frightening. Yes. I, I don't know, I don't count this as hallucinating, but lots of times when I wake up, uh, there are spiders everywhere. It was as a child, and, and even now, just crawling all over the walls and everything. <laughs> and then I'm like, and I'm old enough, and it's happened enough to where I'm like, okay, this is just what my mind does. I'm like, all right, just wake up. Nope, still crawling around. And eventually <laughs> they go away. <laughs> Still bothers me when I was little, probably like. I never seen. Yeah, she never seen. That's good. Yeah. When I was six or seven years old, I woke up in the middle of the night. There was a guy at the foot of my bed, and uh, I, there were no intruders in my house. But I still there was a guy right there standing at the foot of my bed. Anyway. Well, there are lucky people. Fred says he's never had a dream in his life, and I dream all the time. I have. I don't even. A dream? Yeah. He says he's never dreamed. Wow. How are those? <laughs> I have wow. mine are horrible. So I don't tell anybody anymore Every. because they go, Oh really? <laughs> I learned when I was a uh, this is way getting off topic. Rick's like, what are these people doing to me? Okay. <laughs> I learned hey, I'm when the king I, of getting off topic. <laughs> when I when I was a, when I was a teenager, I learned uh, how to tell is this a dream or is this real life? Now, what I haven't learned over many, many years is if you have to ask, it's a dream. Anyway, I haven't inserted that into my brain, but I did learn, look at some writing. If it changes on you, it's a dream. Also, I found if I can do 100 pull-ups, it's a dream. Lots of pull I can finally do pull-ups. This is awesome. And I'm not dreaming this time. This is and then I wake up, ah, it was a dream. Okay, anyway, okay. The next theory, that the disciples stole the body. So they wanted to show risen Jesus, and so they went and stole the body. So later on, you have to understand, let's take it from the perspective of, okay, they stole the body. Okay, Later on, they were persecuted, tortured, and killed because of their steadfast belief that Jesus was resurrected. So why, if they stole the body... If they knew it was a hoax and never actually saw him alive, why would they go through all they went through? And also, by the way, how did they get past the Roman guards? But that's, that's a secondary issue to how would all those people go through the torment, the torture they went through believing in or claiming this lie? Uh, some other flaws to that. Paul would not have been moved by the empty tomb alone. Um, and a lot of people, I don't think, you know, here, because Paul came across, you know, became a Christian a bit later, uh, you know, because he persecuted the church. You think about all the persecutions Paul did, it wouldn't have been a story of an empty tomb that moved Paul. Uh, there was more to it that moved Paul, you know, seeing the resurrected Jesus. And, and you think, would you, you know, if the grave of uh, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was found empty, would you rush to convert? Probably not, you know. Most people wouldn't be converted, wouldn't be moved by, oh, the tomb was empty. Most disciples, Jesus' own followers, with the exception of John, were not convinced by the empty tomb either. Um, now, certainly, we uh, that's an important part of the story, but that's not what convinced people. Uh, if you read John 20 or Luke 24, they were not immediately convinced, even after seeing the tomb empty. Mary Magdalene was in tears. She said, they have taken the body. Mary Magdalene didn't see an empty tomb and say, he's risen, he's risen indeed. She was like, who took his body? In John 20, 15, thinking he was a gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Peter, Thomas, none except John were convinced. They assumed somebody stole the body. But it was, it, so it wasn't even the empty tomb that convinced them, it was the appearances that convinced them. John Stott, the author of uh, this book, Basic Christianity, he writes, were these stories inventions? No one could call these good inventions. So John Stott goes off on this little sidetrack. He says, if someone were making this up, he said, if they really didn't do a great job making it up. And so I'm quoting John Stott here. He says, if we had wanted to invent the resurrection, we might have done a better job ourselves. 
we should have been careful to avoid the complicated jigsaw puzzle of events which the four Gospels together produce. We should have eliminated the doubts and fears of the Apostles. If we were inventing the resurrection, we should have included a dramatic account of the resurrection itself, as do the fantastic apocryphal Gospels, describing the power and glory of the Son of God as he broke the bonds of death and burst from the tomb in triumph. But no one saw it happen, and we have no description of it. We should scarcely have chosen Mary Magdalene as the first witness. So that's just an interesting point. Not anything that's going to convince anyone, but if it were an invented, if a lot of these things were invented, as I said at the beginning, that the Gospels are written in a very, um, a very sane, sober manner with exquisite attention to detail and a lot of showing a lot of the bad as well as the good. And if it were fictitious, it's, uh, you can probably believe that it would have been written a little more uh, dramatically. Okay, any questions on that? Comments? Concerns? Okay. Okay, another theory. The witnesses went to the wrong tomb. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Okay. Here are some flaws with that. Jewish or Roman authorities would have then gone to the correct tomb and could have pulled out the body and displayed it. This wasn't some obscure tomb. It belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. The Romans had placed guards there. So unless everybody involved, disciples, Roman guards, Joseph, everyone, the Sanhedrin had collective amnesia, which is like a collective hallucination, I guess, um, then that doesn't fly. Someone would have remembered, even if a few people went to the wrong tomb, Another flaw, various people went at various times to the empty tomb. It's not that they all went together, they said, oh, he's not here, and they were at the wrong tomb, and then they went home, and that was the end of that. It was various people at various times. Maybe one person could have gotten lost, but not everyone on different trips. People look, looking at just one little piece of the puzzle and say, there's a verse that says Mary went, and I, I don't remember the exact, but that uh, it was before dawn, like maybe it was, she was in the dark and she got lost. Okay, but later on she went back and other people went when it was light. And then you also have to account for what about the appearances? Uh, even if they, okay, they all lost the tomb, nobody knew where it was, um, still Jesus appeared later to them. Okay, and notice the empty tomb did not convince, as I said before, did not convince most of the disciples, uh, except for probably John, uh, possibly John. It was the appearances that turned them from their fear and disarray. Okay, another theory that people uh, grasping for straws here, why the resurrection didn't really happen, the apparent death theory. Um, that Jesus didn't really die. He was almost dead, like in the, uh, that movie. He was almost dead. <laughs> Roman soldiers were very good at what they did, killing people. <laughs> when there was a death sentence to carry out, they made sure of it. The Roman soldiers would not have, uh, you know, they weren't like <laughs> backwoods hillbillies. Yeah, I think he's dead. <laughs> and then just take them off. They were very good at doing what they did. The Journal of the American Medical Association, which is the scholarly journal for, uh, for medicine, in uh, March 1986, they wrote, and this is a quote, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. So there was actually an article, uh, 1986, in the Journal of American Medical Association talking about could Jesus have apparently died, sort of died, but not really, and they said no. Uh, and doctors who look into this sort of thing agree, no, that's impossible. Now, a very uh, moving chapter in this book, probably the most memorable chapter in this book for me, is a story, um, an interview about a doctor who goes through what Jesus physically went through before and during the crucifixion. And just to read that alone, is very memorable, very graphic. Um, but there's no way he would survive that. He was, when he went through all that he went through, uh, and then they crucified him. Then they took him down after being convinced that he was dead. Uh, they, he was embalmed with about 75 pounds worth of bandages. So he could not have undergone all that, then been embalmed, appeared dead to the Roman soldiers, and then awakened 
feel good enough to remove the bandages, remove the stone, and you can't, I can't imagine, the shape he'd be in at this point, and then appear to his disciples in good enough form to spark a movement about the risen Savior. Um, I guess if he made it that far, maybe he wouldn't. But anyway, that's just impossible. Embellishment theories. Stories get embellished over the years and over the centuries, like the uh, how far Grandpa had to walk to school back in his day, how deep the snow was uphill both ways. Stories get embellished. The theory says that the story of Jesus grew. This is a very, very possible, uh, po I'm sorry, not possible, um, uh, very popular. Po thank you, popular. No, it was a pop word. Very popular one that's ingrained in just a lot of people's psyches. That nobody at the time believed that Jesus was resurrected or that he was God or anything like that. It was only centuries later that that story eventually grew. He was really just a great teacher. He was just a good man. And the stories eventually grew so that centuries later he was God. He performed miracles. He was resurrected. We're going to throw in some conspiracy theory here and say that it was all about the Roman government, particularly Constantine, that uh, built those stories up. Now what they draw from is an example from another religion, um, Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama. Now he, lived, he was the founder of Buddhism. He lived uh, in the 6th and the 5th century BC, so five or six centuries before Jesus. And so any Buddhist scriptures that we have come from manuscripts ranging from the 1st century BC to, uh, to onward, which means so Siddhartha Gautama, we have no writings of his time in the, in the 6th century BC. Uh, he left an oral tradition, and then we have writings start to appear about maybe four centuries later. And in at least 400 years between uh, his life and any writings, there was time for embellishment to creep in. Now keep in mind, uh, the writings that we have about Jesus were from eyewitnesses written within a couple of decades. Uh, the people who were there who saw it and these writings about Jesus got passed around and there were eyewitnesses who could have read it and said well we need to change that that's not the way I remember it but so uh, people say well it happened with Buddha there are stories of him doing miracles now what's interesting is that uh, the stories about Buddha doing miracles all of those stories are from writings after Jesus uh, so it's as if, uh, I think, uh, they had the Jesus stories of miracles, and they said, yeah, Buddha did those things too. But so there definitely was embellishment in the stories of Buddha. However, as I said, we have eyewitness accounts of miracles that were written within a few decades uh, when other eyewitnesses were alive who could have rejected anything that was wrong. We have, uh, regarding Jesus, corroborating evidence from outside sources, uh, even hostile witnesses writing that, this was uh, the life of Jesus. We have historical evidence in writings that the church believed in his resurrection within a few years of the event. And so there's no room to say that the story of Jesus as, a, as God, as a miracle worker, grew over the centuries. We have writings about him as a miracle worker and as God uh, in the first century. So we can put that theory away. All right. Any questions on that? Thank you. I was wondering. Yes, um, do you do you happen to know? Like we know that Jesus raised at least two other people from the dead. Uh -huh. Do people try this hard to discount those mm -hmm. miracles? Um, I let me think. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know because, as you know, I'm not as in on you know <laughs> in that <laughs> culture. I, I don't read that much. Um, I, I don't hear much about, I mean, generally, I think it's assumed among these circles, like Bart Ehrman, uh, you know, that just, uh, the Lazarus, that's just a story. And, you know, and the, the young girl, you know, those are just stories. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't read anything specifically, as you say, you know, trying hard. I put a lot of effort to discredit Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, he's... Uh, yeah, he's Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it's just kind of blown off as, you know, the, uh, the whole exodus 
even by archaeologists, we talked about this in my series you know, last semester, that uh, they just kind of blow a lot of that off as, uh, oh, it didn't happen because it couldn't happen, even though there's a lot of evidence that said it did. So I don't think they're trying hard. I think it's just kind of assumed, oh, those are just stories. Yeah. Okay, well, I see it's 45 after, and we're about halfway through, so your handouts that you have, bring them back, whatever. I'll have more next week, but we'll continue on next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh,